Welcome to Coffee and Books channel. In this video we will present the summary of the Institute by Stephen King. Tim Jamison is a divorcee and ex-Sarasota officer who was let go over an accident regarding reckless discharge of a weapon. He was on a plane headed to New York for a security gig, but ends up taking $2,000 cash in exchange for his overbooked flight and decided to hitchhike there. In Dupre, South Carolina, he sees a sign for a night knocker job offer at the local police station and applies for it. Sheriff John Ashworth interviews him, and Tim gets the night knocker gig. Night knockers are basically night patrolmen, in Dupre he has no gun and no power to arrest. Wendy Gullickson, Ronnie Gibson and George Burkett are some of the deputies at the police station. Tim rents a room from Burkett's mother. As a night knocker, Tim does his job well and gets to know the locals. Annie Ledoux, known as Orphan Annie, is a homeless woman who lives in an alley near the police station for safety. Corbett Denton, goes by drummer, is the town barber and an insomniac. One night, the gas station convenience store was getting robbed and the clerk named Absimil Dabira was shot and wounded, so Tim intervened and called an ambulance for the wounded clerk. He also reported the robbers and reported the getaway car so the police will arrest them on the road. Given his professional and heroic performance, Tim was offered a job as a deputy in the police station, but he decides to take some time to think about it. Luke Ellis is 12 years old and a scholarship student at a school for exceptional children, super smart children, in Minneapolis. Luke is more brilliant than most kids his age, he's also telekinetic, meaning he has the talent to slightly move an object just by thinking hard about it. The school has identified Luke as a prodigy and wants to send him to college in Boston. His parents, Herb and Eileen, are concerned as they consider Luke to be too young to be live far from them by his own, but Luke wants to go anyway. Luke takes the SAT and aces it. One night in June, Luke is abducted by three people, Denny, Michelle, and Robin. They enter his house late when everyone is sleeping, and they shoot his parents. He wakes up in an exact replica of his room but without a window. He's in a facility, referred to as the Institute, for telekinetic, DK, and telepathic, TP, kids, run by a Dr. Hendricks and Mrs. Sigsby. Luke meets a girl there named Kalisha Benson who explains that they are in the front half of the facility. She doesn't know what happens in the back half but says kids never leave once they get there. Kalisha introduces Luke to the others. George and Iris Stanhope, both TKs, are from Texas. They explain that some TKs and TPs can control their powers, those who can do it are called positives, and others who can only do it accidentally are called average or pinks. Kalisha and George are positive. Iris is average. Another kid named Nikki, DK, who is a 16 years old shows up too. The kids who are here have been identified based on their high BDNF ratings, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. They also explain that the people here track them, run tests on them and then send them to the mysterious back half. When they give the kids shots, it makes them see dots also known as the Stasi lights. Luke gets his first set of shots. The kids get tokens for doing what they are told which gets them things like soda, snacks, cigarettes or alcohol. The Institute staff also monitor the kids constantly. Maureen Alverson is a part of the Institute staff members who the kids like because she is nicer, but she's actually only does it to be able to report everything she hears to the staff, she is a spy for Mrs. Sigsby. There's a computer in Luke's room but it requires tokens to operate and the internet is limited to prevent certain searches. Luke is called to speak to Mrs. Sigsby. She encourages him to help acclimate Avery Dixon, who is 10, a new member of the abducted children. She also tells Luke that he's here to serve his country and that's all the information he'll get from her. He'll be given shots and tests until he graduates into the back half. He'll serve for a few weeks or months and then his memories will be wiped, she lies and assures him that his parents are fine and he'll be returned to them afterwards. New children named Helen Sims and Harry Cross arrive at the Institute. Kalisha notes that Dixon the 10 years old new kid is a very strong TP, and tells Luke to look out for him. She also says not to get too attached to people here because they'll all be sent to the back half at some point. Luke is forced to have his temperature taken rectally which he hates as he considers to be humiliating, he wonders why they insist on doing it that way and feels violated afterwards. The kids know that Maureen is doing this job because she's deep in debt due to her estranged husband. Luke researches her problem to help her and after researching the subject he tells her how to deal with the debt collectors. However, he also finds out that Maureen really needs money because she wants to send her son to college, he also notices that she is sick. Luke is taken for another treatment where they give him an injection and show him dots that seem to invade his mind. They hit him when he doesn't cooperate. He starts to see the dots until it makes him dizzy and pass out. After this incident. He realizes that the constant experiments on him had gained him some TP abilities as well, 
but he hides it from everyone, especially from the staff of the institute. He asks around and sees it hasn't happened to other kids but discreetly without giving himself away. In the administration Mrs. Sigsby discusses the tests they're running on the kids with Hendrix. Hendrix is a doctor who is experimenting with the dots to enhance the kids' skills, but Mrs. Sigsby is more dismissive of it. She says their main goal is to prepare kids for the back half. Soon, they take Nikki to back half and then Kalisha too. Luke being the smart kid he is, finds a backdoor in the computer he has in his room which enables him to full access to the internet, and then researches his parents and finds out they're dead, assuring his belief that the institute is lying to them. He decides to escape and bring the institute all down. Luke starts trying to explore the facility and finds an elevator card lying on a desk in an office where the staff have taken him for another of their tests. Soon, George is taken away too. Luke learns that the people who abduct the kids have team names. The one that abducted him is the Ruby Red Team. Avery sleeps in Luke's room and is able to deliver messages from the back half via telepathy, due to his strong telepathy abilities, that's the way he keeps in touch with Kalisha who is now in the back half. Kalisha says in the back half the kids are put to work. They have them watch movies which give them increasingly severe headaches. Based on what Kalisha says about the movies that show things like car crashes and specific targeted strangers, Luke pieces together that they are being prepared to being used to kill those strangers via their DK and TP powers. Greta and Gerda are twins that befriend Harry Cross, they are the recent arrivals at the Institute. One day, something is wrong with Harry and he starts to spasm. When one of the twins tries to help, he strikes her by accident as he was gasping for breath. In the end, Harry is dead and so is Greta. Helen is soon taken away and Stevie Whipple a new kid shows up. Avery gets woken up telepathically in the night by the back half kids because something bad is happening to Iris. Luke keeps denying he's a TP. The institute staff say he's lying because he saw the dots. DPs who see dots are able to bend spoons. TKs who see dots become TPs as well. They torture Luke in a tank menacing to drown him, but he resists. They finally think that Luke is not a TP. Maureen admits to Luke that she is a snitch, and she writes him a note thanking him for helping her but also wanting to help him to atone for what she's done. She tells him after they stop testing, he'll only have three days before they take him away. She says they need to meet to talk. Luke asks Avery to help him escape and they meet with Maureen. Knowing their conversation is being heard by the staff, they communicate in notes and signals, meaning two separate conversations, one is a normal one out loud that the Institute will hear through their cameras and mics, the second is simply more in sending Avery a mental note as he can read her mind, and then later when Avery will be alone with Luke he will give him Maureen's message and instructions to help him escape. The Institute is also a somewhat run-down facility that used to have more kids and staff. While the funding is there to pay for upgrades, because of the nature of its activities, and to keep it a secret from the world, it's difficult to bring people in with the expertise to upgrade things like cameras and whatnot. Luke finds a weakness in the fence that Maureen told him about. She also leaves him a paring knife and a flash drive. One night, late when everyone was sleeping, he got out of his room to the institute playing yard and he began to dig under the fence to escape, he used the paring knife to cut his tracker out of his ear leaving it bleeding all over the fence. Outside the fence, Luke realizes that the staff of the institute live in the houses around it. He follows the directions he was given, and looks for a scarf Maureen left to mark the way. He finds a boat which he nicknames the Pokey. He makes his way to the nearby town, the Denison River Bend. As tempted as he is to call the police, he knows that he's suspected for the murder of his parents, as in the night he was kidnapped police showed up when the neighbors notified them that the Ellis family were not seen in days, so when the police showed up they found the parents murdered and their son missing so they naturally assume that the son can be a suspect. Luke therefore instead of calling the police, he gets into a boxcar in a station train with furniture pads in it, and the train rolls away. He later has to switch cars to avoid being caught and eventually he ends up headed toward Dupre, South Carolina. Back at the Institute, Maureen is discovered dead, having killed herself after helping Luke to escape, she left the Institute staff a message written on the wall, Hell is coming. Soon, they realize Luke is missing. They call in Avery for questioning as he was the closest to Luke, they tortured him into giving them information, but he lies a little. However, one of the TPs named Frida, who was hanging out with Avery after the questioning, was able to sense from Avery that he lied in snitches to the staff. She did it in exchange to be able to stay and work and be part of the Anstey 2's staff, instead of being tortured and tested, and also wants some tokens. The Institute identifies from the information that Luke is likely on his way to a few spots by train, Dupre being one of them. They send people to look for Luke at each of the possible stops and tell people he's a runaway. 
They also have people at various places who work for them. Maddie, one of the people that worked in the train station spotted Luke hiding, he lets him know that people are searching for him. After Luke told him that he was kidnapped and begged him not to give him away, Maddie believed him and recommended getting off at Dupre. Luke makes his way off the train, but he's identified by the town's motel owner, Norbert Hollister. Hollister is a stringer for the Institute, meaning an informer. He contacts them looking to collect on the reward for Luke's capture. In Dupre, Luke is brought to the police station. He tells Annie, Tim and Wendy, who Tim is now dating, about being kidnapped in the Institute. Annie believes him as she is always fascinated by conspiracy theories, but Tim was skeptical, to convince him, Luke tells Tim to look at the flash drive more and gave him before he escaped. Meanwhile, now that they know where he is, the Institute sends two teams after Luke, including Mrs. Sigsby. At the Institute, Avery is stuck in the tank as a punishment, and then he was sent to the back half. The kids look worn down, many are zombie-like, and have varying levels of headaches. There's also a hum emanating from Gorky Park in Ward A, where kids are sent after their minds are completely gone and used. Avery realizes they can use their powers to try to ease each other's headaches, and thinks that collectively they are stronger. Avery also figures out that the movies work by showing them a mix of their target, Stasi lights, the dots, a humming noise, and an image of Dr. Hendrix with an unlit sparkler. When they finally show the lit sparkler, it triggers them to destroy their target. Then, Kalisha figures out the humming noise they hear everywhere comes from the power of the Gorks, the kids in Gorky Park, called Gorks because they barely function as people. The Gorks are broken as humans, but are more powerful because their minds are completely gone. The non-Gorks are the ones who can act as a trigger to direct their collective powers, but the Gorks provide most of the power. Avery helps to corral the back half kids together and they hold hands and start to tap into their collective power. Now that the back half kids have banded together, they are able to use their powers to revolt against the staff. They go to War Day and release the Gorks. However, by the time the kids go to release the front half, the staff has disabled the locks in the building, locking them in. Stuck, the Institute kids use their collective powers to call out to Luke. In Dupre, Tim takes Luke to the station and along with the sheriff and others, and Luke suddenly has a flare-up of power that went far beyond what he could do before, because of what the back half kids are doing, when they're linked everyone is able to harness more power. The group at the police station begin to look at the flash drive. It's a recording of Maureen who corroborates Luke's story and also shows them footage of Gorky Park. They see barely functional kids. Tim and all the others now believe Luke's story. But Maureen also notes that without the kids' powers, the world would be in jeopardy. As the Institute is believed to be a government facility that uses those kids to kill political people and people with power to prevent war and the world's destruction. When the Institute team arrives at Dupre for Luke, they send a man and a woman from their team to pose as a tourist couple to investigate the town first. After seeing them outside the police station, Tim asks them to identify themselves, the seem to cooperate but in a sudden move they pull out their guns, and just like that Tim and the other officers begun firing back at the couple, after hearing the loud gunshots, many of the town's people try to help, like Drummer and the Dabir's twins who Tim helped at the gas station robbery, after the dust settled, many are left dead, including Sheriff John. In the end, the Institute team is subdued, with an injured Mrs. Sigsby and Dr. Evans still alive. Luke received the message from the back half and he knows they are trapped and need help. Along with Tim and Wendy, Luke demands that Sigsby put him in contact with Stackhouse, the Institute's chief of security, he was the one in charge back at the Institute after Mrs. Sigsby left for Dupre. Luke wants to negotiate. Luke wants all the kids, in exchange he'll give Stackhouse the flash drive and Mrs. Sigsby, as well as promising to keep the Institute a secret. Stackhouse agrees. Tim and Luke are heading towards the Institute. Wendy will stay back at a hotel as an insurance policy to make sure someone is safe and can blow the whistle about the Institute in case they try to hurt Tim and Luke. They also demand a plane, van and a bus from Stackhouse. At the Institute, Stackhouse worries about the Zero phone, which is a phone on Mrs. Sigsby's office and only rings in emergencies, through that phone, a man with a lisp contacts them on. This man is both Stackhouse and Mrs. Sigsby's boss and they are terrified of him. On the other side of the Institute, Kalisha has a dream about phones and people speaking different languages. The back half kids realize there must be more kids in other countries like them and more institutes in those countries that are all working together. So, there is more power to be harnessed. At the Institute, some staff leave and escapes and the remaining staff gets into place to ambush Luke by orders of Stackhouse. The plane with Tim, Luke. Sigsby and Evans and it arrives, and they drive a van the rest of the way. 
Tim puts Mrs. Sigsby behind the wheel to drive the final stretch, just in case to prevent being shot on the spot. When the van approaches, the Institute staff sees Sigsby but shoots anyway as they want to kill Luke at all costs. She's riddled with bullets, but Tim and Luke survive by dropping to the bus's floor. Meanwhile, Avery senses that something is happening outside and knows it's time. Avery acts as the connection to the other kids at the other facilities through his telepathy, but it requires him to stay at the Institute. He connects with all the kids around the globe which creates a metal projection of a large phone. The rest of the back half kids use their enhanced power to bust through the locked door. They see that the staff has poisoned the front half kids with gas, and they keep running as the walls and floors of the Institute start to come apart. Due to the strong hum generated by the telepathy and telekinesis of the kids combined, the front half of the building levitates and then falls, crushing all the poisoned kids and the remaining staff, and sadly Avery too. When the dust settles, there are some back half survivors, but all the front half plus Avery are dead. Almost all the staff is dead as well. Of the kids, Helen, Kalisha, George and Nikki have survived. They ditch the staff and join Tim and Luke on a car who was given to them by an Institute staff member who Tim spared his life in exchange for the car, the group drove off, and in order to get some cash the kids used their powers on an ATM and the money was pouring like rain from the ATM slot. Three months later, the lisping man shows up at a farm where Tim, Wendy, Luke, Kalisha and Nikki are. George and Helen have already been sent to relatives, with stories about being kidnapped but not saying anything about the Institute or their powers. The Lisping Man wants to remind them not to say anything about the Institute. The Lisping Man also tells them that the Institute was set up for the safety of the world. It started around the 1950s. There are also, much rarer, people with precognitive abilities who can see the future. The precogs identify future threats and then the Institute kids take out those threats. However, Luke tells the Lisping Man that this system is flawed. Mathematical models suggest that precognition is most accurate in the immediate future, not in the distant future. The further out time-wise you go, the more random it becomes. The Lisping Man disagrees and leaves. Kalisha and Nikki are returned to their family members, but Luke has no relatives so he stays with Tim and Wendy. The novel ends with Luke thinking about Avery and how heroic he Thanks was. Thanks for watching, please subscribe for more.